Good morning, my name is Amit Kara. I'm a cardiologist at Mass General Hospital and a scientist at the Broad Institute. And today I want to discuss uh, some of our recent work on genome-wide polygenic scores. There are of course a large number of people to thank, but I'll highlight uh, Mark Chaffin, a talented computational biologist in our group, and Say Catherayson, my postdoc research mentor, and uh, funding by, via a career development award from the NHGRI. So, I'll try to convince you that we've really reached a tipping point for polygenic score prediction, and it's a topic we've heard uh, mentioned a couple times already this morning. And I, I thought it'd be useful to really walk through a timeline, and thinking back to 2007, only a little over a decade ago when some of the first genome-wide association studies were published for diseases like coronary disease, breast cancer, diabetes, and others. And it was an incredibly exciting time because for the first time we had robust and reproducible common variants associated with disease. In some cases, the underlying biology uh, was, was uncovered. But at least in the clinical community, there was also a sense of disappointment because if you look at the top variants, they changed people's risk for disease by, let's say, 5 percent. And people really didn't feel like that was a clinically meaningful difference in risk. A natural next step would be to say if one uh, single genetic variant accounts for only a small proportion of the variants, what would happen if we combined a set of variants, 10, 50, 100 variants, into a polygenic score? And in 2008, 2010, several groups actually showed that this, uh, these scores were predictive of, uh, of disease and, and aggregating variants was useful. But again, it was felt to be of limited utility when it came to clinical practice. Despite that, between 2010 and 2000 and 2013, it became clear that these common variants in the population actually explain the vast majority of disease heritability, much more than some of the rare variant associations. Theoretical studies in 2013 by Nalajan Chatterjee and others highlighted that there's the potential for risk stratification in the future as we move to larger GWAS sample sizes. And I'll argue that in 2018 and now 2019, uh, it's really one of the first times that we're able to identify clinically meaningful increases in risk. And this is uh, partly our work, but a, a large number of groups across a number of disease areas. So what's changed? Well, I'll say first is that the larger GWAS sample size gives us a greater precision for effect estimates. So you can imagine with a small GWAS, you can be quite confident that the top variant on the list changes risk by 5 percent. But what about the 3 millionth variant on the list? Does it change risk by 0.1 percent or 0.2 percent? And that subtle difference in precision can actually be quite meaningful when you're aggregating information across millions of variants. Secondly, there's been a lot of uh, work using um, new com computational algorithms to actually combine information from a genome-wide set of variants. And thirdly, we have large biobanks that are now available for validation and testing of some of these scores. So when you think about genomic medicine, really at its core, we want to find a small subgroup of people who are at increased inborn risk for disease and ultimately identify these people, disclose their risk to them, and, and develop an intervention that might help attenuate that risk. So as a cardiologist, I'm most familiar with familial hypercholesterolemia. This is a disorder in which there's a single mutation in any of at least three genes that prevents people from clearing cholesterol from the circulation. So the cholesterol is markedly elevated from the time of birth. And on average, this leads to a tripling of the risk for heart attack, especially at an early age. And it turns out that these mutations are actually present in 0.5 percent of the population, or one in every 200 people. But the question then becomes, what about the remaining 199? What might you be able to say about their inborn risk for diseases like heart attack? So, uh, a little over a year ago, we started with a hypothesis that actually, if you thought about a genome-wide polygenic score, it may actually be possible to identify people uh, with greater than triple the normal risk for disease. We took as a starting point a pretty simple file. It was the, the GWAS summary, uh, summary stats file from a um, 2015 GWAS. It's literally a file with 6.6 .6 million rows, and for each variant it says what's the odds ratio or impact on risk for heart attack. We were agnostic to the approach of how we might combine information from all these variants. So we used a, a variety of different approaches to and algorithms to combine these, these, this information from these variants into a, into a single score and tested. We said, which of these scores actually does best in a testing set? This was 120,000 people from the UK Biobank. And it turned out that what we observed was actually the more, the, the, the scores with the larger number of variants, in fact, the score with all 6.6 .6 million variants, tended to outperform all of the other scores in predicting risk for heart attack. 
we then got back to our initial question, which is, is it actually possible that those in the tail of the distribution actually have risks similar to familial hypercholesterolemia mutations? And here we, what we discovered is that if you say the top 8% of the polygenic score, we call those high polygenic carriers, and the bottom 92% uh, non-carriers, it turns out that these top 8% of the population actually have triple the normal risk, just as observed for familial hypercholesterolemia. Now, here I'm showing you the traditional clinical risk factors between those in the top 8% of the polygenic score versus the remainder of the population. And what you can see is that there's subtle differences in known causal risk factors. Hypertension, 68%, 64 versus 64%. Family history of heart attack, 47% versus 36%. And mean LDL was on average eight points higher. So again, although as you would expect, the causal risk factors was enriched in these high polygenic score individuals, this was not sufficient that such that I could pick them out of my clinical practice if they came to my clinic today. Moreover, we showed in a, in a recent paper that we could generalize this approach to a range of diseases, heart attack, atrial fibrillation, diabetes, inflammatory bowel uh, disease, and, and breast cancer. And really, in each case, uh, there was an ability to encapsulate genome-wide uh, variation into a single number, that's a polygenic score, and identify individuals with triple, quadruple, or even five times the normal risk for disease. And this is something that could be done from the time of birth. So I wanted to also share some unpublished data, and this is um, thinking about one of the real public health threats of our time, which is obesity. As many of you know, the rates of obesity in America and actually around the world have, have uh, increased substantially. But one of the things that's actually less appreciated is that as the rates of obesity have gone up, so too has the variance in the population. And what that actually suggests is that the increase in weight has not uh, been spread uniformly across the population. But there are actually certain subgroups which may have put on weight in, as they were exposed to an obesogenic environment. So we thought we'd explore how polygenic susceptibility to obesity actually uh, impacts weight over the lifespan. So again, we started with a simple list, 2.1 million variants from the giant uh, genome-wide association study published a few years ago. Combined information from all 2.1 million variants into a single number, that's a genome-wide polygenic score for obesity. And we said, okay, in the UK Biobank, which is a middle-aged population, how does this um, polygenic susceptibility play out over the decades? And so this was over three, about 300,000 people, average age was 57. And here, what I'm showing you on the x-axis is just the polygenic score decile, so each group has almost 30,000 people. And on the y-axis is just the average weight of these, of these individuals. And what you can see is that those in the lowest polygenic score decile on average weighed about 159 pounds versus in the top decile 188 pounds. So there's a 29 pound weight gradient that could be captured by this single number uh, by the time folks reach middle age. And we reserve similar results in looking at males, females, in units of BMI that, that, adjust, for, um, that adjust for height squared. It was about a five unit uh, BMI delta across these deciles uh, for those who are more familiar with that measurement. What about severe obesity? Here is a definition uh, commonly used as body mass index over 40. It's actually one of the most rapidly growing aspects of severe obesity in our country. And again, I'm showing you that if you were in the bottom uh, decile of this polygenic score, there was only a 0.2% chance that you were severely obese by middle age. By contrast, in the top decile, the rate was almost 6%. And many of the remaining 94% actually had less severe forms of obesity. So again, by middle age, we're able to capture a 25-fold gradient just based on this one number across deciles of the score. What about earlier? And we then said, well, if you look at uh, young adults, the vast majority of us, uh, I'm not sure if I'm a young adult or not, but the vast majority of young adults are, are, are not severely obese. And we said, how does that actually play out as they transition into middle age? And so for this, we uh, looked at two prospective cohort studies, the Framingham Heart Study and Cardia. There are about 4,000 individuals, average age 28. None of these folks were severely obese. And we followed them forward, forward for 27 years. And here I'm showing you on the x-axis just the 27 years of follow-up. And on the y-axis is their risk of developing severe obesity over time. And what you can see is that those in the bottom decile, only about 1% of them went on to develop severe obesity versus in the top decile, the rate was 16%. So again, this is a single number that really identifies people who are on very different trajectories of weight gain as they transition from young adult to middle age. 
What about even earlier? And so we, we uh, reached out to folks uh, in, in the UK who, who led the Allspack birth cohort. This is about 8,000 people. Uh, pregnant moms were recruited, and these folks, uh, the offspring, were measured from birth to the 18 years uh, longitudinally. And we said, how does the score, uh, again, developed on data from adults, but how does it, it, it impact, for example, weight at birth? Here I'm showing you again on the x-axis is just the polygenic score decile. And then the y-axis is the weight in pounds. And what you can see is that at birth, there's a pretty minimal association of the polygenic score decile uh, uh, with the birth weight. And then I'm going to walk forward over time as these folks started to age. And this is eight months, uh, 18 months, where you really start to see a pattern emerging. Here's 3.5 years as folks are entering preschool or kindergarten, eight years in elementary school, and 18 years. And again, you really start to see these, these deciles separate and, and increase resolution over time. So uh, this is just a summary, which really suggests that the gradient across deciles is only about 0 0.1 pounds at the time of birth, uh, but increases uh, to uh, two pounds at 3.5 years, eight pounds by eight years of age, and actually, by 18 years of age, we actually found a gradient of 27 pounds. And this um, gradient was actually almost identical, identical to what we observed in the UK Biobank, who again had a mean age of 57, 27 versus 29 pounds. So really, as you might expect, suggesting that genetic susceptibility really starts to uh, have its impact very early in life. So this. Uh, previous section was really thinking about clinical risk stratification and, and what, what is the opportunities to find genetically high risk people. But another really striking finding is really to think about the tails of the polygenic score distribution and what can that actually teach us about new biology. So I mentioned the case for heart attack. If you look at high versus low polygenic score people, I couldn't pick them out of my clinical practice, but there was enrichment for causal risk factors which suggests that if you knew nothing about uh, coronary artery disease and its risk factors and just simply uh, made a table one of clinical risk factors, biomarkers, uh, and lifestyle factors, there's a good chance you would have been able to rediscover all these known associations. And so while heart, heart attack is actually very well characterized, there are a large number of variants where we urgently need to identify new biomarkers or new pathways. And this is where I think molecular profiling of individuals whose, again, their genetic susceptibility placed them at very high or low risk, but to be able to identify them actually before the onset of disease could be quite powerful. And especially when you think about overlaying uh, metabolomics, proteomics, uh, getting to a single cell analysis in relevant tissues, or even um, polygenic score-based callback studies, again, to really probe how does their physiology differ uh, before they develop disease and how does that ultimately manifest itself in disease, oftentimes several decades later. So uh, just one concrete example was uh, a study um, I did in collaboration with Sohail Zeed, a medical student at Harvard. And it was actually a study of only 320 people, uh, 160 who had very high polygenic score for obesity, uh, and 160 who had very low, uh, again, polygenic score for obesity. And we essentially just did an unbiased proteomic scan. We looked at over 4,000 proteins that could be measured in, in the circulating blood. And what we was really striking is that we essentially were able to rediscover uh, leptin, which is a very known, uh, well-known adipokine regulating appetite and satiety. So we obtained a p-value of, of 10 to the minus 8, again, with only 320 people. And many of the remainder of the hits were also uh, known adipokines. So again, this is um, proof of concept, but leptin is already known, of course, especially well in the, in the obesity um, uh, obesity field, but it just gives me more confidence that this approach will be useful when we generalize it to many other diseases. So I'll close with just a few conclusions, which is really that um, a number of groups in 2018 have really demonstrated that genome-wide polygenic scores enable identi identification of high-risk individuals, and this can be done from the time of birth and so before the onset of any disease. Secondly, the extremes of the, of, the, of the score distribution are enriched in causal disease pathways. And I'm hopeful that we can actually use this enrichment and, and combine that with molecular profiling uh, to uh, uncover new disease biology. Thank you.